Welcome back to the Chinese Revolution. I want to give the state of China in 1921 when the Communist Party of China was founded. Let's start in Beijing and then work clockwise around China and beyond China. Firstly, we're in the heart of the so-called warlord period. Xu Qichang of the Anhui clique is president of the Republic of China. In 1921, he was in the third year of his four years as president. He would be replaced in 1922 by the Julie clique, which was then in control of Beijing. For much of 1921, Qin Hunpeng, originally of the Anhui clique, was premier. But there had been a schism in the Anhui clique, and Jin had the support of the Julie clique and the Fantian clique who had won the war against Anhui the year before. And he also had the support of other cliques. At the end of 1921, a non-partisan member was premier for six days. And then Liang Shiyi, who was outside of the Anhui clique, became premier for about five months. His support included representatives from Guangdong in South China. In the big picture, the premiership changed 34 times between the death of Yuan Shikai in 1916 and the takeover of Beijing by the Nationalists in 1928. Sometimes a premier would return multiple times, such as Duan Qi Rei, who I've mentioned before. He became premier five times among those 34 changes. The presidency changed 14 times during the same 12-year period, so the presidency was a bit more stable. But 14 presidential changes in 12 years is hardly stable government. Xu was the longest serving president during the period. If you've seen the movie The Last Emperor, Xu was the president who hired the British tutor for the former Emperor Puyi. In the movie, the tutor, Reginald Johnston, was played by Peter O'Toole. In real life, Xu was interested in Puyi's education in case a constitutional monarchy by Puyi would be needed. Perhaps we should not read too much into the premiership and presidency during this time. In 1921, we were between the Zhili Anhui War, which Zhili and their Manchurian allies had won, and before the Zhili Manchurian War, when Manchuria lost to Zhili. The Zhili clique was relatively successful on the battlefield in this time, defeating both the army of the Anhui clique one year before and the Manchurian army one year later. So the premiership depended on the support of the victors on the battlefield. And generally, the foreign powers recognized whoever was in charge in Beijing. Moving north and northeast, clockwise from Beijing, we move up to the areas controlled by Zhang Zulin and his Fengtian clique. He had allied with the Julie clique during the war the previous year and was very powerful. He not only led the three provinces of Manchuria, but also the former imperial hunting grounds immediately north of Beijing, around Chengdu, as well as Inner Mongolia and Ningxia, north and northeast of the capital. So his territory, when the Communist Party was founded, stretched northwest, north, and northeast of Beijing. He had important support from the Japanese. But at this point, they were working behind the scenes, and Zhang, the Manchurian warlord, was king of the north. Japan had annexed Korea next door to Manchuria in 1910. Japan had also taken over Russian possessions in Manchuria after its victory during the Russo-Japanese War in 1904-1905. It had control of the least Port Arthur, today's Dalian. It also had control of the Chinese Eastern Railway and Zone and the South Manchuria Railway and Railway Zone. I say Zone because the area of control was wider than the railway, and there were swaths of Japanese-controlled land and railways within Manchuria. One link went from Siberia to Vladivostok through Chinese Harbin, Another went south from Harbin to Shenyang, 
which then branched in three directions, east to Korea, south to Port Arthur, and southwest to Beijing. And north of Marshal Zheng's territory was Mongolia and the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. It became the USSR in 1922. China still claimed Mongolia, and most maps from the Republic of China period showed Mongolia and Tibet as part of China, but not Taiwan, which was under Japanese occupation. In spite of Chinese efforts to regain control of Mongolia, by 1921, Mongolia was independent. Also in 1921, it was invaded by white Russians who were losing the Russian Civil War. After that, Mongolia was supported by Soviet Russia. When the Mongolian leader died in 1924, that country officially became the Mongolian People's Republic. Now looking immediately south and east of the capital was Jirli province. Not surprisingly, that was controlled by the Jirli clique, and Sao Kun was its formal leader. The Jade Marshal, Wu Pei Fu, was also important, as he had defeated the Anhui clique's armies in battle the year before. Moving a bit further southeast along the coast is Shandong. It also, in 1921, was under the control of the Zhili clique. However, the former German holdings in that province in 1921 were still controlled by Japan. It was the next year, in 1922, when Wellington Ku got the Japanese to give up those claims at the Washington Conference. The Zhili clique dominated the area immediately south of Beijing. It controlled Hubei, Henan, Jiangxi, and even Anhui province now. The Anhui clique's control had weakened considerably, and they were left with only a few areas along the coast, around Shanghai and in Fujian province. In 1921, there were foreign concessions in all the important port cities, as well as a foreign legation quarter in Beijing, where Chinese law did not apply. These concessions could be found in cities like Dalian, Tianjin, Shanghai, Xiamen, Guangzhou, and along the Yangtze River in Wuhan. In 1921, the Japanese also had concessions in Hangzhou, Suzhou, Jingzhou, and Chongqing, among others. The French also had a concession in Kunming, the capital of Yunnan, just north of French Indochina. The British had additional concessions too, including some ports in Shandong and along the Yangtze River. The Chinese were generally treated poorly and as second-class citizens in the concessions. This colonial mentality fueled resentment by Chinese. Shanghai before the Opium War, had about 200,000 people. Now its population in 1921 was just under 2 million. So that's a tenfold increase. About half were living in the foreign concessions. Like we'll discuss in Hong Kong, Chinese made up the vast majority of the population. The foreign concessions in Shanghai were crucial for dissidents, and publishers of radical books and newspapers. It should not be surprising that the Communist Party first met in a foreign concession in Shanghai, where there was more freedom than in Chinese-controlled parts. Moving south in 1921, Sun Yat-sen was president of a government in Guangdong province. That's the Chinese province closest to Hong Kong. It also controlled Hainan Island, a large island south of Guangdong. Hong Kong was a British colony. More than 95% of its population was Chinese. By 1921, British control had already extended from Hong Kong Island, ceded following the First Opium War, to Kowloon, across the Hong Kong Harbour after the Second Opium War, and in 1898, Britain had leased the new territories north of Kowloon 
and also on the mainland, for 99 years. In 1921, Britain was 23 years into its 99-year lease of the new territories, and firmly in control of Hong Kong. I'm not sure of its population in 1921, but I've seen a website claiming its population was 864,000 10 years later in 1931. So it was a sizable city that had grown under British colonial administration from its previous fishing villages, but it did not yet seem to have a million people. Macau was an overseas province of Portugal, while the Republic of China was the government that introduced the term unequal treaties into its education system and messaging, it recognized British control over Hong Kong and Portuguese control over Macau, at least temporarily. Macau's population was and is considerably less than Hong Kong's. Hong Kong, including the new territories, is considerably larger than Macau, which is very densely populated. In the far southeast, Taiwan was under Japanese occupation. As mentioned earlier, until the Second World War, the Republic of China didn't consider Taiwan to even be a territory to be retrieved, like Mongolia or Tibet. In 1921, China considered Taiwan to be part of Japan's empire. Moving back a little bit towards the middle, Hunan declared independence in 1921. It went from being led by Zheng Qingyao to Tian Yan Kai. Mao Zedong was there and supported Hunan's independence. At that point, he had been critical of the warlord Zheng, who was cruel to farmers, suppressed publications, slashed education spending, lodged troops in schools, seized bank assets, smuggled opium, and sold lead mining rights to German and American businessmen. Mao was about 28 years old in 1921. Of course, Mao will be discussed more in future episodes. But having been under a warlord like Zhang, it's easy to see why Mao had become anti-establishment in his home province. West of Guangdong, Guangxi had its own clique, as did Yunnan further west which had a different one. South of Guangxi and Yunnan provinces was French Indochina. The French then controlled what is now Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Tibet, even further west, was de facto independent, but China considered it to be part of the country. It was really operating outside of the warlord struggles, under the leadership of the Dalai Lama. In the Northwest, the Ma clique, named because their leaders all shared the last name Ma, ruled Gansu, Qinghai, and Ningxia. They were Chinese Muslims, also known as the Hui, and Ma is a Hui shortening of the name Muhammad. Once the Qing abdicated, a Ma was in charge until the People's Republic of China replaced them in 1949. After 1928, the Ma clique was allied with Chiang Kai-shek's Kuomintang and fought communists. They were still defeating communists in battle as late as August 1949. Further out in the northwest is Xinjiang. After the Qing abdication, its governor, Yang Zhengxin, maintained power with the support of the Hui Muslims. That area recognized whoever was in power in Beijing, but had considerable autonomy. Russian economic interests were very strong in the region. And while Young warned Muslims about the godless communists, he was also practical and had diplomatic and economic exchanges with the Soviets. Yin Qishan was firmly in control of Shanxi province from 1911 to 1949. He survived by focusing solely on his province and not trying to occupy others. He generally supported whoever was in charge in Beijing while preserving his local power. He was assisted 
by the fact that his province is surrounded by mountains on three sides. He had a military education and had spent two years studying in Japan. He became a revolutionary and was appointed marshal by Sun Yat-sen himself. Yen was sometimes called the model governor by Westerners. He gave lectures and wrote about his ideas. He was also interviewed. He was rare in that he allowed his troops, mostly locals, keen on staying in Shanxi, to practice with live ammunition. They were considered good shots. He also introduced forms of socialism with high taxes, which caused economic decline. And his province also experienced famine. What was noticed was how active Yen was in exploiting coal resources when other provinces were slow. Public buses and trucks even ran on steam, using the cheap coal. Yen also created an early rising society, built schools, campaigned against opium, and tried to eliminate foot binding, although he was resisted by other local officials. He had become very wealthy, but didn't show it. Yu Yu Ren was in charge of Shenxi in 1921, which is next door to the other similar-sounding province. He would be out in 1922. And the map I built shows all of Asia. I've tried my best to be accurate on the rest of Asia in 1921, but history is complicated, and there were lots of things happening in other places, like what is now Saudi Arabia, Iran, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, etc. And I called Malaysia British, although it might better be called a British protectorate, as I called some areas in the Middle East. I've tried to make the map accurate for 1921, but I'm sure it could be improved. If you have any advice for the map, let me know, and I'll do my best to update it. I've also created two versions. One has today's provincial and national borders in black for context. The other doesn't show borders. Please use whichever you prefer. As always, thanks for listening to the Chinese Revolution.